Alright, good morning. Now, where we left off last time in our, in our lesson was we had shown that both logic and reason uh, demonstrated to us over the first several lessons that there is a transcendent, a personal, infinite, eternal, self-existent, mutable, morally perfect God who is the first uncaused cause of everything else that exists. We talked about that in the first several lessons. We talked about the, the different arguments from logic and reason uh, for the existence of God, what we as Christians call the general revelation of God. And we've seen through last week's uh, talk about a lesson about how those things are only really consistent with one worldview of religion, and that's monotheism, the belief that there is only one such God as that with those attributes. And that led us to the three monotheistic religions of the world, that being Judaism, uh, Islam, and Christianity, uh, that do not, of course, describe God in the same way. But all of them claim to be talking about the same God, a God who, uh, who got involved in human history, a God... The God of the Old Testament, in other words, uh, is, of course, the God of, Jude uh, God of Judaism and Islam, as well as Christianity. Now, of course, there are very big differences, right, between these three, very big ones. Uh, Islam claims that the Old Testament is corrupted. Uh, Christians, we Christians believe that the Messianic prophecies of the Old Testament were fulfilled, have been fulfilled through Jesus Christ. And then, of course, uh, Judaism denies both of those claims. And when you look at these three, really it is in the person of Jesus Christ where you see the biggest, most striking differences. Islam claims that Jesus was a great prophet, but not the Son of God. To Judaism, uh, Jesus was a pretender who was not the Messiah, not the Son of God. And then, of course, to Christians, to us as Christians, Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God, who was crucified and died and resurrected for the redemption of our sins. So, how do we then go forward from here? Uh, and I think the answer is that we investigate Jesus, that we look at His historicity, His place in human history, what we find of Him, in archaeology. We look at the New Testament and we say, hey, these are accounts of Jesus here on earth. Do we have good reason to believe that this provides us with an accurate view of history? How do we demonstrate that to the skeptic? Uh, what do we find of Him in historical records outside of the Bible by non-Christian sources? And then from these answers to these questions that we find ourselves in a much better position to respond to the skeptic with respect to differentiating between these three. If, of course, uh, we don't find a reliable <coughs> account of Christ that backs up Christianity, uh, then you, you know, the skeptic would be more favorable of uh, Judaism or of Islam. So, uh, but if we find that these answers provide us with good reason, uh, good account of His work, reliable account of His work, reliable, that the New Testament is in fact reliable, well then we have our answer there for the skeptic there too. And so that's where we turn. That's where we'll turn today is first to the historicity of Jesus. And I think we should probably begin with the most basic premise of all if we're answering the skeptic. And that most basic premise is that Jesus Christ of Nazareth did indeed exist and walk on this earth. Now you may think, well Shane, that's starting a little bit too basic. But I don't think it is. Uh, before we can begin to weigh uh, whether Christ is the Messiah and Savior of the Christians to demonstrate to skeptics that, that we as Christians say that He is, we've got to first demonstrate to skeptics that it is entirely reasonable that we believe that He did in fact exist and walk on planet Earth. Uh, one of the most popular misconceptions about Jesus among skeptics, amongst non-believers, um, is that there is no mention of Him outside of the Bible. And that somehow this suggests, you know, that therefore He didn't exist in one earth. In, in his essay, Why I Am Not a Christian, a man named 
Senator Tron Russell wrote this. He said, historically, it is quite doubtful that Jesus existed. And if he did, we do not know anything about it. So that I am not concerned with the historical question, which is a very difficult one. Many skeptics share Mr. Russell's view. Um, why, they ask, should we even believe, the skeptic asks, that this man existed. But one would be hard-pressed today, I think it is safe to say, to find very many knowledgeable historians who would agree with Mr. Russell. Um, many people have raised questions about Jesus. Many have doubted that what the Bible says about Him is true. Many skeptics have. But the circle of those who claim that He never existed at all, or that if He did that we can know nothing about Him, is very small. Very small. As a, a man named F. F. Bruce, who was a professor at the University of Manchester, said, some writers may toy with the fancy of a Christ myth, but they do not do so on the ground of historical evidence. The historicity of Christ, which is another way to say whether he existed in human history, is axiomatic for an unbiased historian as the historicity of Julius Caesar. All right? Well... That should be too surprising to us as Christians because as Christians, our faith is grounded in history. Okay, The Christian faith, our faith is grounded in history. The New Testament is absolutely dependent on history. You can't read through the book of Luke, right, can you, without seeing these references to these proconsuls and these regions and these areas throughout, uh, throughout, the, throughout Palestine. You can't go through it without seeing it. The Christian faith is an assertion that God intervened in human history and got involved that he sent Jesus Christ here to earth on in the Middle East. And it's something that really happened here. Our faith is grounded in history. Of course, the best accounts, the historical accounts for what Jesus did here on earth are found in the New Testament. And we're going to get to those. But to that skeptic who says to us, I mean, show me why you believe Jesus is. It's not necessarily a good answer to those skeptics always to say because the Bible tells me so. Because then the skeptic's going to say, well, I don't believe in the authority of the Bible. And we've talked about that objection before. And we're going to turn to that in more particular detail with respect to the New Testament. But this is another way of the skeptic to say, all right, look, the Bible, from the skeptic's view, may be biased in its accounts. The skeptic would say, Oh, it's just a fairy tale. We can't necessarily trust the Bible to be objective because it was written by advocates for Christianity. And this is another way of saying, like, uh, if... All right, I'm an Auburn Tiger football fan. All right? And if you wanted to know how Auburn Tiger is going to do this fall, you might not completely uh, trust the reporting of the Plainsman, the Auburn student newspaper, right? But if you were to see an account... In the Alabama's Crimson White student newspaper, they talked about how good Auburn was going to be this fall, how Jared Sidden was going to win the Heisman Trophy. Boy, that'd be great. <laughs> then, <laughs> then you would probably, if you read that account in the Crimson and White, you might say, well, you know, maybe the Plainsman is looking at it through rose-colored glasses. But if you saw it in the Crimson White, you might think, well, maybe we should take a harder look at this Jared Sidden fellow. Well, that's another way of the skeptic saying, well, these are biased accounts, right? The Bible's a biased account. All right, so perhaps a good way to begin with this is to say, all right, before we begin, before we turn to biblical accounts, and while we believe that it is reasonable and trustworthy, let's first start with the non-Christian account. Let's look to even anti-historical sources. Since those kinds of sources, such as the crimson and white, would have nothing to, and not that I'm comparing all right, the crimson and white to pagan non-Christian sources. Or nothing. <laughs> <laughs> never to pay, I don't want anybody to say that I did that. <laughs> but before we look at whether we should value the biblical account, let's look at those non-Christian sources, okay? Since those kinds of sources would have nothing to gain by saying anything that would be helpful about Christianity and the events surrounding Jesus Christ and His following, which they in many cases disdain, then that wouldn't make them especially good witnesses, right? Mm -hmm. For it. 
So let's look at them and let's see what he finds. What was he like? What did he do? Where, what did he live? What happened to him? Does it show us anything? Well, as it turns out, it does. It does show us something. I think it shows us quite a lot. Now, before we get into this, don't, don't, don't get the wrong idea. As I said, the New Testament, as we'll discuss in the upcoming weeks, is the most reliable historical trustworthy account of Jesus Christ and what he did and what happened. But what, we're not going to go into that today. And instead, today, we're going to go into these outside sources. That's kind of like corroborating evidence. Okay? So if... I'll pick on John Stockton again. If John Stockton is accused of robbing a bank in Decatur, okay, and somebody had a video of John on the afternoon in question driving southbound on I-65 across the Tennessee River Bridge, that would not demonstrate that John robbed the bank but it would put him in the general area and it would be corroborating evidence which would suggest to us that it was a little bit more likely that he may have done so, right? It corroborates the main evidence. Well, that's what we find in a lot of this stuff we're about to look at. It's corroborating evidence that demonstrates the reasonableness of the account in question. In John's case, it would support the notion that he was indicated on the afternoon in question, but in doing so, it makes it more reasonable for us to take a harder look at the evidence, right, of what John did. John did not rob the bank. I don't think he did. He broke the bank. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's take a look. Where we're going to start is with Cornelius Tacitus. As you know, Christianity came along uh, in the age of the Roman Empire, a vast empire that stretched from the Rom uh, British Isles to Africa and to the Middle East. The Romans were aggressive conquerors. They expanded from modern-day Italy all throughout the ancient world. They brought revolutionary practices with them. They brought feats of engineering like Roman aqueducts to carry water long distances. They implemented Roman roads which made communication within the empire uh, greater and more feasible. Of course, Jerusalem and the Israelites were subject to Roman rule. They were subjects of the Roman Empire. Uh, and they practiced their, their very insular Jewish culture and religion while being subject to Roman taxes and Roman laws and Roman governors. Tacitus, or more formally, uh, Caius Gaius Publius Cornelius Tacitus. Yeah. Impressed with that. <laughs> was a Roman senator, an orator and arguably one of the best of the Roman historians. His last major work was entitled The Annals, which was written about 116-117 A.D. It included a biography of the Roman emperor Nero. Uh, in 64 A.D., Nero was suspected of secretly ordering that part of Rome would be burned down to support one of his public building projects. Well, there was a great fire. He was suspected of doing that, and so he tried to shift blame onto the Christians living in Rome. This was the occasion for Tacitus, this historian, to mention Christians whom Tacitus disliked and despised, as you'll see. So this is what the historian Tacitus wrote, which is translated from Latin. And I know that some of you in the back probably cannot see that. I understand. Let me read it. Hence, to suppress the rumor, that was the rumor that Nero had burned part of the town down, Nero falsely charged with the guilt and punished Christians who were hated for their enormities. Christus, the founder of the name, was put to death by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea in the reign of Tiberius. But the pernicious superstition repressed for a time broke out again not only through Judea, where the mischief originated, but through the city of Rome also, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. He's obviously not a fan. Accordingly, an arrest was made first, made of all who pleaded guilty then upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city as of hatred against mankind chariot goes on to describe the tortures and things were uh, imposed upon these Christians that were rounded up. That is not a very charitable quote for Christianity. The man obviously dislikes Christians strongly. He's not going to do us any favors. So he has nothing at all to gain from saying this great historian what he believes to be a fact. And he was known for investigating the things that he said before he wrote them down as a careful historian. 
And what did he say? He said that Christus, which translates to the Messiah in Hebrew, was the founder of religion and was put to death in Judea by Pontius Pilate. This is absolutely huge. This is the same story that is confirmed and attested all other kinds of things about the Roman Empire, which historians state to be true. Tacitus, like most classical authors, does not necessarily reveal his sources here, but he hasn't done that elsewhere. It doesn't take away from what he is saying. He's universally acknowledged as one of Rome's greatest historians, arguably the best of all, at the top of his game, and he's never given to exaggeration, and he provides a plain account. Would have had access to Roman government, governor, uh, uh, government records, and he clearly says, Christus was put to death by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea, in the reign realm of, Judea, of, uh, of Tiberius, the emperor of Tiberius. Now we can stop there with one of the top historians of his age. Um, but there's more. So let's, let's turn to another one. Josephus. Now Josephus was a Jewish priest who grew up as, aristocrat, uh, as an aristocrat in the first century Palestine, and he ended up living in Rome as a part of the emperor's inner circle. It was in Rome that he was given the emperor Vespasian's family name, Flavius, as his Roman name. While in Rome, he composed two great Jewish histories, the Jewish War and another book, the much longer Jewish Antiquities, which he finished in about 93 to 94 AD. Now, lots of Jews viewed him as a traitor because of his involvement with the Roman government. It was by the command of the Emperor Vespasian's son, uh, Titus, that a Roman army destroyed Jerusalem and burned the temple in about 70 A.D. Now, Josephus' two books were written in Greek for educated people, and he tried to present Judaism as a religion to be admired by the Romans for its moral and philosophical depth. He wrote these works only decades after Jesus' death. Jesus' known associates would have been Josephus' contemporaries. Okay? The Jewish Antiquities mentions Jesus twice, the shorter of the two passages, and the one that is the much less controversial of these two references is a simple notation that is incidental to something else that Josephus is telling about. Um, it was trying to identify Jesus' brother James, the leader of the Christian church in Jerusalem. According to this passage, the governor of Judea was temporarily absent in 62 A.D. And in his absence, the Jewish high priest, and Ananus, and I may not be saying that one right, mispronouncing the word, instigated James's execution. So Josephus is trying to relay this story because ultimately it results in Ananus losing his high priesthood. And so Josephus is telling about it, and in the process of telling about it, he's got to mention what Joseph, what uh, Ananus did, what the high priest did, and so he says. He writes, So he, meaning Ananus, assembled the Sanhedrin of judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. Okay, that's it for the reference to James by Josephus in this passage. The only reason James was mentioned at all again was because his death ended up and Ananus losing his high priesthood, and that's what Josephus was talking about. James was a common name, and so as you can see, Josephus was trying to, to, to talk about who this James was by describing him, and how did he describe it? By reference to his famous brother, right? So he said, the brother of Jesus. Now Jesus was also a very common name. So he needed a way to identify and specify that. So he said, Jesus, who was called Christ? In, in, in Greek, Christ, Christus, uh, just like the reference from Tacitus, is a reference to the word Messiah. So this passage gains credibility as an affirmation of Jesus' existence because the passage, passage is not even about Jesus. It's about James, but it is by reference to Jesus. So now you can take the two of those together. That extraneous phrase would not have made any sense at all. Jesus hadn't been a real person. Wouldn't make any sense at all. 
All right, so then we come to the next one. Now, this one's a little bit controversial. Okay? The Testimonium Flavinium. Josephus' first shorter reference to Christ is sometimes overlooked because of this one. A much more famous and more controversial passage in the Jewish Antiquities book that I was talking about. The longer reference to Jesus is known again as the Testimonium Flavianum. It can be viewed as additional outside evidence from history in addition to those two I mentioned. It is found in that part of Josephus' work that deals with Pilate's time as the governor of Judea. It reads as follows, and I have some of these in italics, and when I get to those parts that are in italics, for those of you guys in the back, I'll, I'll put air quotes and let you know. And I'll tell you why I put them in, a, in italics in just a minute. This is the passage. Now, this, this all surviving manuscripts of uh, the testimony that are in Greek, like the original, contain the same version of this passage with no real significant differences. It says this, Around this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. For he was one who did surprising deeds and a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Messiah. When Pilate, upon hearing him accused by men of the highest standing among us, had condemned him to be crucified, those who in the first place came to love him did not give up their affection for him. For on the third day he appeared to them restored to life. The prophets of God had prophesied this and countless other marvelous things about it. And the tribe of Christians, so called after him, have still to this day not died out. Josephus from the Antiquities. Now, you read this and you think, whoa, whoa, whoa. Did Josephus write this entire report about Jesus and Christians? Because some of it does not read like the rest of the stuff that we see Josephus say. So we got three possibilities here. Number one, the whole thing's authentic Josephus. Number two, none of that's Josephus. None of that passage is Josephus. Number three, part of that's Josephus and part of that's not Josephus. Now, with respect to option one, almost no scholar accepts the authenticity of the same things. Things like this, well, they didn't have copy machines back then, right? So Josephus' work wasn't had put down on a copier and just copied off. You had scribes who would write and who would who would copy from one thing to another. And these scribes worked in all together, and they were the vast copy machines of the day. Almost no historian accepts this entire passage of Josephus. And I mean, I'm no scholar, but I, I don't either. Josephus was a strong advocate for the Jewish faith, for the Jewish religion. There's nothing else in any of his work that demonstrates that he was Christian. And yet the things that he says here, you can look and see that's not, that doesn't appear to be consistent at all with, with with a non-Christian view of things to say that Christ was the Messiah. So calling Jesus the Messiah as this passage does kind of goes against everything else that Josephus was, was saying throughout and all the rest of his work, even in that other reference to James that we talked about just a minute ago, which actually comes later after this, there's no indication that Josephus is actually Christian. So it doesn't seem that that option, number one, is it. That is not entirely Josephus. But number two also is very unlikely. It is very unlikely that none of this is Josephus. Because what is written in the expressions that are all used in Greek are entirely consistent with everything else that Josephus has written. The way he introduces this passage, some of the phrases that he uses within are entirely consistent with him and fit much better with Josephus' writings mm -hmm. than other Christian writings of the same period. We have other Christian writings. We're not talking about those today. And, and the terminology and the phrases that they used aren't consistent with a lot of this passage either. So it doesn't seem that the whole thing has been... Um, it doesn't seem that there, there are problems with the whole thing. There are just certain passages within here that there seems to be problems with. Plus that earlier reference thing that we talked about by James uh, that mentions Jesus uh, in order to identify James sort of suggests or implies that Jesus has been mentioned before in the work. And this comes before. So number, number two also seems unlikely. So what that leaves us with is number three. And number three appears to be the consensus of very many people. And that is that this passage is based on an original report by Josephus that has been modified by others, probably Christian scribes. And that seems to be the most likely explanation. After one of uh, 
pulls out or extracts what seems to be Christian additions, which are shown in italics here, the remaining text appears to be true Josephus. Um, as a Jew, Josephus would not have presented those beliefs as his own. So option three is, is generally considered to be an uh, overwhelming consensus of scholars is that there are parts of this that do appear to be added. So let's read it again without those italicized parts and see what it tells us. And it still tells us quite a lot. Around this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, for he was one who did surprising deeds, and a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. When Pilate, upon hearing him accused by men of the highest standing amongst us, had condemned him to be crucified, those who in the first place came to love him did not give up their affection for him, and the tribe of Christians so called after him have still to this day not died out. All right? Now, let's pause after that. We just look at these three things. Let's stop. And let's take a look at what we can learn from these two famous historians, both very well respected as historians, who were not Christians at all. In fact, were, as you've seen, opposed, generally speaking, to it. All of these statements about Jesus are corroborated by these two non-Christian sources. One a Jew and the other a Roman. Number one, he existed as a man. If any Jewish writer were ever in a position to know about the non-existence of Jesus, it would have been Josephus. And Tacitus is recognized as a careful historian. That's not what we see at all. He existed as a man. Number two, his personal name was Jesus. Number three, he was called Christos in Greek, which translates to Messiah, or anointed, or anointed one. He had a brother named James, who led a Christian church. Number five, he won over both Jews and Greeks. Number six, Jewish leaders of the day expressed unfavorable opinions about it. Number seven, Pilate uh, rendered the decision that he should be executed. Number eight, he was executed by the Roman authorities and his execution was by crucifixion. Number nine, he was executed during the Pontius Pilate's governorship over Judea during the reign of the Emperor Tiberius, which of course places it well within history. Hey, we get that. From those two non-Christian, hostile to Christian sources that are well recognized as valued historians. Now these two also show, you know, that uh, Jesus' followers didn't abandon their personal loyalty to Him after, after His death. Um, Christ, as a term used to identify Jesus, became the basis of the term to identify the group that followed him, Christians. We see that from there too, that the movement began in Judea, that it expanded eventually on into Rome. Now these are two, the two greatest historical sources that I see because of their directness and because they're otherwise considered to be such great and careful historians. But hey, let's, why stop there? Let's keep going. Now some of these other sources that I'm going to show you, I don't think any of them are quite as impressive as the others. Many of them have controversy attached to them as you would expect from historical sources. But let's go through some of these. First, the Talmud. Okay? The body of Jewish civil and ceremonial law. It's the central text of Judaism as far as Jewish law. It's made up of discussions and commentary on Jewish history, on Jewish customs and law. Uh, in one portion of the Talmud we see a reference that looks very much like a reference to Jesus Christ. It reads, It has been taught on the eve of Passover they hanged Yeshu. And an announcer went out in front of him for 40 days saying he is going to be stoned because he practiced sorcery and enticed and led Israel astray. Anyone who knows anything in his favor, let him come and plead on his behalf. But not having found anything in his favor, they hanged him on the eve of Passover. Another version of that text says Yeshu the Nazarene. Now, the word hanged can be viewed as another way of referring to crucifixion. One Jewish scholar notes that the Talmud speaks of hanging in place of crucifixion since that horrible Roman form of death was only known to Jewish scholars from Roman trials and not from the Jewish legal system. This passage certainly suggests that it's talking about Jesus Christ. And that, and what, is it, what does it suggest? Well, it suggests that the Jewish authorities were against his teaching. And, and they were involved in him being sentenced to death. 
It suggests some unusual occurrences because it is suggesting that he practiced sorcery, a charge that, as you know, was leveled against Jesus in the New Testament. That he was executed at around Passover time. And now there are other sporadic references to what in Jewish traditional literature to uh, that appear also to refer to to Jesus Christ. In a 1982 article, man named uh, Professor M. Wilcox put it like this. He says this: the Jewish traditional literature, although it mentions Jesus only quite sparingly and must in any case be used with caution supports the gospel claim that he was a healer, a miracle worker, even though it ascribes these activities to sorcery. In addition, it preserves the recollection that he was a teacher and that he had disciples and that at least in the earlier rabbinic period, not all the sages had finally made up their minds that he was a heretic or a deceiver from Jewish traditional custom. And here's another one. Lucian. Lucian of Samosata. I don't know that I pronounced that right. In 115 to 200 AD, writing now a hundred years after Christ, was a Greek satirist who wrote something called The Passage of Peregrinus. It was a book about a former Christian who later became a revolutionary and died in about 165 AD. In two sections, while discussing this man, Peregrinus, <coughs> Lucian, without naming Jesus, clearly refers to him, albeit in a very scornful way, full of contempt for Christianity. Lucian was like a humorist. He was like a, the talk, a talk show host monologue. It kind of reads like that, you know, it, poking fun, being sarcastic. And this is what he said. He was talking about this Peregrinus. It was now that he, Peregrinus, came across the priests and scribes of the Christians in Palestine and picked up their queer creed. I can tell you, he pretty soon convinced them of his superiority. Prophet, elder, ruler of the synagogue, he was everything at once. Expounded their books, commented on them, wrote books himself. They took him for a god, accepted his laws, and declared him their president. Then he says this. The Christians, you know, worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced their novel rights and was crucified on that account. He goes on beyond this to write in a different passage talking about Christians, calling Christians misguided creatures. And he says, and then it was impressed on them, Christians, by their original lawgiver that they are all brothers from the moment that they are converted and deny the gods of Greece and worship the crucified sage and live after his laws. And they all this they take on trust with the result that they despise all worldly goods regarding them merely as personal property. And then he goes on to call Christians simple souls who are easy to be played upon by others. He's not a fellow who speaks very kindly about Christians at all. And yet, there's no assumption by Lucian that Christ was not real. Lucian seems to have gathered his, his uh, information from sources that were independent of Christian writings. As a result, his writings are generally accepted by some to be important evidence for also the existence of, of Jesus. All right, now I'll show you another. Now, this one isn't acknowledged as impressive by many of the others because it involves a Christian writer who is writing about another historian of his day from before his day. And so it is a form of what I would, as a lawyer, call hearsay. But uh, I want to mention it because to me it's just so fascinating. Okay? Uh, one of the first secular writers to have reference to Christ, according to this, would be a historian by the name of Thallus. In around uh, 52 AD, it seems, this fellow, Thallus, wrote a history of the Eastern Mediterranean world. Unfortunately, though, his writings have only been found to us in fragments. And those fragments come to us from references that other writers made back to what he said. See what I mean? And so, one of the several writers who referred to Thallus' work was a man named Julius Africanus who was a Christian who penned his work in about 221 A.D. He had access to Thallus' writings. Africanus writes a passage talking about Thallus, where Thallus made a comment about the darkness that enveloped the land during the late afternoon hours when Jesus died on the cross. Africanus is discussing the Gospel account of darkness and an earthquake at the time of the crucifixion. Africanus writes, on the whole world there pressed a fearful darkness and the rocks were rent by an earthquake and in many places in Judea and other districts were thrown down. 
The Christian writer writes this. But then Africanus says this. Thallus, in the third book of his histories, explains away this darkness <coughs> as an eclipse of the sun. Unreasonably, it seems to me, unreasonably of course, because a solar eclipse could not take place at the time of the full moon, as it was at the season of the full moon that Christ died. Now, I think that that is a fascinating passage because in other words, that Africanus is saying, yeah, this historian Thallus, who is not a Christian, was saying in his histories that, yeah, there was this darkness that occurred at the time of the crucifixion, and he attributed it to an eclipse. He didn't say it didn't exist. He didn't say Christ didn't exist. He didn't say there was no darkness. Instead, he tried to explain away what the darkness was. And so in this later letter, Africanus is just taking that and saying, well, he said it was, a, he said it was an eclipse. You know, and, and I say this, which is a reference to an earlier historian, which suggests that they were trying to explain the way that there were darkness throughout the land when Jesus was crucified. Um, another interesting one is this, Pliny the Younger. Now, Pliny was the governor of a Roman province in Bithynia uh, in northwestern Turkey in around AD 112. Much of his correspondence with the emperor Trajan is revealed to us. A lot of it is about the minutia of being a governor of a Roman province and calling and asking, or, or not calling, <laughs> writing and sending letters saying, hey, can I, do I need to do this for a fire brigade? Do I need to do this for the... And, and a lot of this correspondence is preserved. But in one of his letters, he specifically refers to Christians and seeks counsel from the emperor on how to deal with them. Now, this isn't friendly either. He's basically... Uh, it's, it's not an account that's sympathetic to Christians. Uh, uh, Pliny is basically talking about how many Christians he should kill. Okay? Neither one of them mentioned the crime the Christians have committed, though it's assumed that it is a crime for being a Christian. Uh, because it <coughs> because of the stubborn refus refusal that many Christians had throughout the Roman Empire to refuse to worship Roman gods or refuse to bow down to the emperor as a, as a god. So here's what he writes. They asserted, they being Christians, that the sum and substance of their fault or error had been that they were accustomed, they the Christians, to meet on a fixed day before dawn and to sing responsively a hymn to Christ as to a God and to bind themselves by oath not to some crime but not to commit fraud, theft, or adultery nor falsify their trust nor refuse to return a trust when called upon to do so. When this was over, it was their custom, Christians, to depart and to assemble again to partake of food, but ordinary and innocent food. Even this, they affirm, had, they had ceased to do after my edict, by which, in accordance with your instructions, I have forbidden political associations. Accordingly, I judged it all the more necessary to find out what the truth was by torturing two female slaves who were called deaconesses, but I discovered nothing else but depraved, excessive superstition. Pretty rough. What does that passage by Pliny tell us about Jesus Christ? Well, it tells us it attests to the rapid spread of Christianity both in the cities and the rural areas. Amongst all classes of people, it talks about the religion worship of Jesus as God. The Christians follow high ethical standards and what weren't easily turned from their beliefs. Y'all, there are other references in history, from history, and you can find a lot of skeptics who will still quibble with uh, Thallus and Lucian and the account of the Talmud that I've shown you and certainly others, not so much with those first two because they are so good, but they're even with <coughs> them. But what you, here's what you don't find, all right? Here's what you don't find. You don't find any text, ancient text, or person that argues Jesus didn't exist. You don't find that. They may have ridiculed Christians. They may have talked about torturing Christians. They may have scoffed at their faith, called it a pernicious superstition, as Tacitus did, but they never questioned Jesus' existence. In Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Christ, he interviews a man named Professor Edwin, uh, Edwin Yamauchi from uh, Miami of Ohio University, who is considered to be a pretty accomplished scholar and archaeologist. And so Strobel asked him this question. And in the handouts in the back, that's the, uh, the Strobel chapter is what I've got for y'all as a reference. He said, let's pretend that we didn't have any of the New Testament or other Christian writings. Even without them, what would we be able to conclude about Jesus from ancient non-Christian sources? And Yamachi replied, 
Well, we would know that first, Jesus was a Jewish teacher. Second, many people believed that He performed healings and exorcisms. Third, some people believed He was the Messiah. Fourth, He was rejected by the Jewish leaders. Fifth, He was crucified under the reign of Tiberius, the <coughs> emperor of Rome at the time. Sixth, despite this shameful death, His followers who believed that He was still alive spread beyond Palestine so that there were multitudes of them in Rome by A.D. 64. And seventh, that all kind of people from the cities and the countryside, men and women, slave and free, all worshipped Him as God. So what does that mean? What does that all mean? Well, it means this. It means that since these things are attested by these non-Christian sources, and in some cases entirely hostile to Christianity, that it is entirely reasonable for us to conclude that these things are true. That they bolster and serve as corroborating evidence to the testimony of the New Testament. And it becomes mighty difficult in the face of this stuff for the skeptic to then say, well, there was no Jesus or that He was not crucified, or that He was not believed to be the Messiah during that period. And if those things can be taken as true, then one must simply not discount the New Testament and say, as some skeptics would, well, that's holy made up stuff. That's holy fairy tale stuff. Right? Skeptics, atheists, that's holy made up. No. If these things can be attested by outside historical sources that have nothing to gain at all from supporting Christianity, and in fact would take shots whenever possible at Christianity as we've seen, then one cannot simply dismiss the New Testament writings. You must take it seriously. In other words, the skeptic cannot now reasonably say that the New Testament is all false or is holy false. Why? These things corroborate much about the life of Jesus that is found in the New Testament. And so there is, it is only reasonable for one then to give the New Testament greater consideration and to continue to explore. And so, that's what we're going to do. That's where we go from here. Now that we've seen that these extra-biblical sources give corroborating evidence that the historicity of Jesus and much of what we can know about Him from the New Testament... Next, we then turn to that New Testament to see what can be corroborated and that whether we can see from it that it is trustworthy. Alright, now in this class today, we, we have gone deep into some of this archaeological stuff in these huge passages. And I have seen at times some of y'all's eyes glazing over in your heads. I don't want to do this stuff. But the point of it was this. I want to demonstrate to you and to show you that this thing, this popular misconception among skeptics, that this, the, 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 they call it the Christ myth, is entirely without basis because there is numer numerous historical accounts and good historical accounts from good reliable historians which demonstrate that in fact He did live, He was crucified, He was considered the Messiah. And if you get that from outside the New Testament, then you've got to take the New Testament more seriously and you've got to explore it and then see if what you see there is also consistent with archaeology, and then you've got to look at it and begin to take it more seriously and respond to the objections people make to it from there. The point is that Jesus is historical, and our faith is grounded in history. All right, that's it for today. Thanks, guys. <laughs>